I'm Senator Mike Brady, and I want to welcome you to Brady Works. We're doing a periodic monthly show to talk about issues going on in my district. I'm the senator from the 2nd Plymouth District, which starts in, in the town of Northeast and then the city of Brockton, goes through the towns of Whitman, Hanson, Hanover, Halifax, Plimpton, and I share East Bridgewater with Senator Walter Timothy. I'm glad you're here watching us tonight. We've got some very important information going on at our local hospitals. But before I get into that, I just want to remind everybody that the election is coming up. Please get out and vote in November. It's very important for the city of Brockton. And I just want to give you some information. Our legislative leaders recently have a meeting on the APA spending bill, and it's going to be on Governor Baker's desk by the time we break before Thanksgiving. And we're looking to make sure that funding gets spent adequately into our district. The details are being worked out still as in negotiations are underway, but we're looking to put money into housing, infrastructure, and many other initiatives, and this is so important for our district. I am fortunate, I said on the Ways and Means Committee, so I'm going to be put, putting in input as well. If anybody wants to know more information, please don't hesitate to contact my office, 617-722-1200, 617-722-1200. And also, they can email me at michael.brady at masenate.gov. So today, we have two of our local nurses, um, and there's been continuous issues. We dealt with uh, Stewart Healthcare taking over a lot of hospitals in our area in Massachusetts. And it's been a big burden on our constituents, the residents we represent, and the people who work in our hospitals, our first responders, our nurses. And, you know, with all we went through with COVID last year, it's been a very difficult time. We lost too many families, and it's been a very serious, difficult time. And I go back to even before COVID, when they closed the maternity down at the Tottenham Hospital, they didn't tell the residents. All these families looking to have babies born, they rushed up Route 24, heading to the Good Samaritan Brockton. And it's been so bad, babies have been born on the highway, and it's just not right for the residents that we represent. So. Um, then we went through COVID, and our first responders were out there, our healthcare workers, our firefighters, all of the supermarket workers, and they continue to do the work day in and day out, but it's still, still been a difficult burden. And we passed some legislation to protect our healthcare workers. We passed legislation to have uh, enough employees in the emergency room in the intensive care unit, and that got lifted during COVID, which was understandable, but now that moratorium from the governor has stopped, and they still do not have enough people hired in these hospitals. And these nurses are getting burnt out day in and day out. And I just want to uh, emphasize a couple things. Supplies, we're lacking supplies <coughs> in these hospitals, uh, forced overtime working and so forth, and many other things, and re recruitment and retention. So I'm going to introduce two of our great friends, um, Karen, who was with the Mass Nurses Association, and uh, you can introduce yourself, Karen, and tell what you do there now. Sure. My name is uh, Karen Coughlin. I am a registered nurse um, for over 36 years. I sit on the Massachusetts Nurses Association's board of directors and the uh, um, chair of their workplace violence task force. And I previously worked at Taunton State Hospital, um, which is from the Department of Mental Health mm -hmm. for well over 34 years. And Ann, I believe you work at the emergency room at Good Samaritan? Yep, I've been at the Good Samaritan for 42 years. I work in the emergency room. I started there as an LPN and went on, got my RN, and I'm still there. Well, we appreciate all the time and effort and the work that you've both done over the years. And, and you know, we were out there supporting nurses when this, we were in the heat of the pandemic. We're not over it yet. We encourage people to get vaccinated. I, I had... I uh, gotten COVID back in Thanksgiving of last year. Luckily, I had no symptoms, but I did test positive. Fortunately, later on when it was my time, I'm 59 years old, I did get the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. I had no problems with it. It went fine. And I encourage people to get vaccinated because not only for yourself, but to, to protect the people around you. And our nurses are on the front lines working on our behalf every day. So I'm going to let them take over and explain what's been going on. And either one of you can lead the the charge here and explain what's going on because you are on the front lines. Yeah, well, we we have a severe nursing shortage, um, and it's not just at our facility; it's at all hospitals all over the country. Um, they're just not hiring the staff. The work conditions, the patient loads, 
um, lack of supplies, lack of ancillary staff is causing a huge burden on the nurses. That they're feeling that they can't take care of their patients the way they were trained to and the way they want to take care of their patients because there's just not enough of them to go around. So I think I can expand a little bit on that. Um, when we talk about a nursing shortage, actually in Massachusetts, there is no nursing shortage. We graduate between three to 4,000 nurses <coughs> every year in the state of Massachusetts. And recent studies have shown that Massachusetts actually, per capita, has more nurses than many of the other states in the country. And we actually have a surplus of nurses through 2030. The issue is, is that hospitals, it has now come to the forefront. They're saying nursing shortage, we can't keep nurses, et cetera. The thing is, is that this started years before the pandemic. They stopped hiring nurses. They decided that they, their end goal was profits over patient care. And that is what the model that they have been using for years. So we have seen a deterioration of the amount of nurses, and not only nurses, but other staff within the hospital, like Ann had said, respiratory therapists, technicians, housekeeping, unit secretaries, all of the things that are part of important pieces that makes a hospital great and makes it work and the patients can receive the care that they so need and they so deserve. The pandemic only exacerbated this because what has been happening is that under the conditions with lack of supplies, lack of um, you know, um, enough staff to help, nurses are being overburdened with their workload and they can't sustain it. It is not sustainable. And so we are seeing nurses leave the profession because they can't sustain it. They have stepped up to the plate time and time again to take care of patients in their community. And now we believe it is time for hospital administrators and hospital executives and these corporations that own these hospitals to take care of the people who are trying to provide the care that they are making profits off of. So that is one of, that is the issue, really. It has come down to um, the nurses, I believe, are the canaries in the coal mine mm -hmm. um, that are saying, this is not sustainable. We're losing too many people. We can't keep them. And we need to come up with some creative solutions in order to address the problem. And you brought up a good point. This started long before the pandemic. Yes. Uh, and, and obviously during the pandemic, things got worse. We were lacking PPEs, proper equipment, et cetera. Thank God, uh, you know, and we have a couple of hospitals in the, in the district. We have the Good Samaritan, which is up on Oak Street, the old Cardinal Cushion. We have the Neighborhood Health Center. We have the VA Hospital, which is for the veterans on Belmont Street and Brockton, Route 1, 2, or 3. And then we have the old Brockton Hospital, which is now Signature to Healthcare. We did have another hospital down the street, the Garden Memorial in Stoughton, that was on the Brockton line. That closed several years ago. They use it for other entities. But uh, in the beginning, it was so bad, we didn't have enough equipment. And we had meetings with all the hospitals and all the officials. And thank God for people like Sue Joss with the Neighborhood Health Center. She went directly to President Biden, because no disrespect to our governor and the administration, but every other week they're changing their mind. They're shifting supplies for PPEs to one unit, then they're shipping it to another unit, then they shipped it out to Foxborough. And I have a tough time driving to Foxborough Patriots Stadium on a normal day, never mind when there's a Patriots game going on. Mm -hmm. An elderly person, they're lucky if they take their, their car to the market once a week. They, they don't want to drive to Foxborough. So that took a lot of work and effort. Thank God that the Shaw Center is being used to do testing and vaccines. But now we're still going through the pandemic, but now we're moving forward and we're seeing other things that are just, it's, it's beyond my comprehension. I heard you don't even have toilet paper, enough stacks of toilet paper in the hospital. I haven't encountered that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Occasionally you'll go in there and there isn't any toilet paper, but I don't feel it's not that they don't have the toilet paper. I feel it's they don't have the staff to put the toilet paper in. Right. Yeah. I think one of the problems that we've seen, in addition to lack of supplies, lack of PPE, et cetera, is that over the last several years, we have seen many of our essential services within our hospitals throughout the state mm -hmm. close. So we have seen, and the pandemic only made it worse, we have seen psychiatric units closing. We have seen um, down in Taunton, Morton Hospital, they closed initially their pediatric unit a few right. years ago. Then they could just close their maternity mm -hmm. unit. Those patients from those areas, they have to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
um, psychiatric patients, they need to get the services that they need. We've always had a lack of um, essential beds for psychiatric services. We, during the pandemic, we have seen a cutback of the ability for those patients to access And a services. huge increase and in that increase, population. Right. An increase in that population also. And so where do they go? They go to the emergency mm -hmm. rooms. So we are seeing an influx, particularly at Good Samaritan, of psychiatric patients who are needing services, and they are being boarded in those emergency rooms. We are seeing, um, with the closure of Norwood Hospital, because of the flooding, mm -hmm. they had psychiatric services there. They had a maternity unit there. They had people who went there from the local community to receive emergency services. Where are they going now? They're going to Good Samaritan. We're getting ambulances from Westwood, Norwood, Canton, I mean, Westwood's quite a, quite a ride from us. Sure. And if you're having a real emergency, say you're, somebody's having a stroke or somebody's having a heart attack, that's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. That EMS has to sustain that person to get them there so that they can get the care that they need. And we're a level three trauma center. Right. And then once they come there, it's not like they have increased the number of staff within their emergency department mm -hmm. and in their inability to retain staff on their units so that those patients can then, the flow within the hospital, they can then move patients from the emergency room up to a unit. Mm -hmm. It's nearly impossible. So you have a lot of patients we, just boarding in the emergency room who are not receiving care because they don't have the staffing and they don't have the ability to move them to other units. And that has got something to do with a little bit about, I think the nurses, they have said at the moment, this hospital makes a huge amount of money, right. a profit. One of the, it is, I believe, the most profitable hospital actually mm -hmm. in Massachusetts when you take a look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and they are saying, listen, we know that you make a money from elective surgeries, but for now, those patients in those non-essential, non-life-threatening surgeries, those are the types we're talking about, those patients are taking a bed right now from someone that we could be moving from the emergency room into that bed mm -hmm. in order to receive care. And for now, until we can come up with some solutions to get more staff in here, to get staff to stay in addition, could we put a moratorium for a bit <coughs> on elective surgeries? And beyond that, could you sit down with us, the nurses who provide all this direct care and make your hospital work? Mm -hmm in order to come up with creative <coughs> solutions and so that we can have, provide better care for our patients. I think that's what we're looking for. We have a 42 bed unit in the emergency room. Then in addition to that, we fill the hallways with stretches. They're labeled H1, H2, H3. I forget how many hallway patients there actually are. But one time, just less than a week ago, we had 25 admissions in the emergency room waiting to be able to get beds upstairs, and another 20 people that were constant observations. So that's 45 people, mm -hmm. three more than the actual rooms we have. So the hallways were totally loaded with people. We can't get the patients upstairs because there's a nurse and patient ratio on the floor, which we do not have in the ER. Mm -hmm. If they don't have enough nurses, even though they have empty beds, they can't take those patients. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you have the sink, you're running the faucet, the plug's in the sink, the water's going to overflow right. unless you can open up that drain. They need to do something about the staffing issues so we can move these patients upstairs. It's not that the patients aren't getting care in the ER, they're not getting the care they would be getting if they were able to be moved up to the floor. Right. And I've heard that, they're, like you mentioned, they're in the hallways and some could be mental health patients that need to go into the proper area. And, Your elderly and, patients, yeah. um, people with dementia that just don't understand and all the noises and things that go on make it very scary for them. Right. We're not going to let anything happen to them, but it's a scary environment. We passed the budgets last year and this year to put more money into mental health issues to get them more accessibility and proper uh, facilities to go into and so forth, but I, I've heard that the, the emergency rooms are so overburdened with people in the hallways and everything else, and then the retention of nurses, too, or the lack thereof, because I heard that the nurses get trained and everything else, <clears throat> and then they're, you know, practically almost being forced to work overtime. They're getting burnt out, and, and I know a truck driver is only allowed to go so many hours on a, on a road job before they get a rest and, and take a break, 
and nurses are getting burnt out, and it's a very serious issue because they're taking care of their patients, and you don't want mistakes being made if somebody's burnt out, and so I'm hearing that they're, they're so overwhelmed that they end up leaving the local hospitals and going elsewhere to get other, other jobs in, in other places. They're and, leaving in droves. in droves. That's what I've heard, yeah. So, I, um, Think I, about a normal person's mental health mm -hmm. during this whole COVID thing of all the unknowns and the scariness and everything. And now you have a nurse that's worked in the department in an emergency room or an ICU for years and has never encountered anything like this before. Right. And you're loaded down with even more patients that you normally had. Mm -hmm. You can only sustain that level of energy and critical thinking for so long before emotionally and physically and mentally you are just so exhausted you have to go. And then, <clears throat> other than, like, I know we dealt with the PPEs and lack thereof when COVID first hit us. We have more supplies for that, but I'm hearing, what other supplies are, are they missing in the hospital that you don't have access to because it might be in another department you have no one to get that? I mean, initially, we had seen that throughout the, throughout the Commonwealth, actually, mm -hmm. in, in many of the hospitals mm -hmm. throughout the Commonwealth. It would, it would depend on what, what unit you worked on, what um, floor you worked on, what department you worked on, as to where your supplies could be. Sometimes they were freely available. Right. Sometimes they were under lock and key. Mm -hmm. Nurses during the pandemic were forced to rewear masks that when we were going through school, et cetera, we would never have used that mask more than once. Right. Um, you would wear it and then you would take, when you left the patient's room, you would take that off and you would dispose of it. Nurses were being asked to you know, keep it in a paper bag and tack it up onto the wall and use it for the entire week. Right. Um, so we are seeing those types of things. Um, it is unfortunate that oftentimes that you see um, these hospitals that typically, it's, they're not community hospitals anymore. Mm -hmm. They're owned by corporate offices. Right. They're owned by hedge funds. They're owned by everyone who makes big decisions, but they don't take a look at like who those decisions mm -hmm. affect. They're looking for their profit. And so yes, a lot of times they cut down on whatever is needed. So that could be simple things like something to transfer a patient from one bed to another, mm -hmm. um, something to put on the bed so that the patient doesn't soil themselves right. and is protected. I, I know those we, types of things. We toured the hospitals in the beginning of the pandemic with the local fire department here, and we, we saw the lack thereof of that mm -hmm. um, emergency equipment. And then now, as, as I'm hearing, and I hate to be repetitive, but you have even a tough time getting a hold of toilet paper, which is so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Never mind when you get a procedure on a patient that they're doing an operation, you can't find the <coughs> equipment. Uh, so moving forward, I know we're, we're short for time. What would you recommend? I know I don't know when this is going to be taped on for the people to see, but if anyone, any information that you need to get out there to the public, I know there's an event, uh, it's a rally going on on Pearl Street um, this week. When, tomorrow. 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 So what is the date of that? October 6th. Okay. From 4 to 5.30 4 to 5. at the Brockton Fire Museum yes. on Pearl Street. And everybody is welcome that would like to come and support the issue of, of safe staffing and increasing staffing in your community and, and hospitals. Think, and I think in the meantime, the emphasis really needs to be on, you know what, nurses are um, inventive people. Mm -hmm. When it comes to being able to take care of their patient, they will come up with all kinds of solutions. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be able to have a discussion at the table right. with the administrators at this hospital in order to come up with solutions, in order to increase and retain the nurse staffing levels mm -hmm. within the hospital so that patients can be well taken care of. And Supply, the, the more important thing is taking care of the patients. Right. And we can only do that if we have enough staff on hand. Is there a phone number or website for people to call to get more information as well? Do you have anything? Um, well, I would say that they could go on to the um, Massachusetts Nurses Association website, okay. which is www.massnurses.org. Mm -hmm. okay. And the information related to the rally and the issues that these particular nurses are facing. And in all actuality, public, you should go on that website anyways, mm -hmm. because it will give you all kinds of information related to what nurses across the Commonwealth are facing right now in the hospitals within the right the I've world. talked to some of our colleagues too and the chairpersons of the um, Committee on Public Health and Health Care Services and we plan on meeting with them again 
uh, because we have periodic meetings to discuss all these issues and, and I think this has to be brought to the mm -hmm. forefront and, and I agree that the nurses who are on the front lines have to be at the table when this discussion takes place. Um, I want to say that we have some of the best <laughs> nurses I've ever worked with in 42 years mm -hmm. in our facility. But even the best people can only be at their best for so long. Right. Because they're physical human beings. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the car engine. If you don't put gas in it or change the oil, it just doesn't work anymore. Right. You can only do so much. Mm -hmm. And I remember during the pandemic feeling like, if you know the show MASH, mm -hmm. that that's what I felt like in the very beginning mm -hmm. when we had a lack of supplies and everything, that we were going out to combat in flip-flops. Right. That, that's mm -hmm. what I felt like. And yet, so many of us are still there that worked through that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And even though the Delta virus has started to increasing, we're not seeing it like we did back then, but they're doing nothing to help increase our staffing. Right. Nothing at all. I mean, they are doing a couple programs, but the people that come, like when Norwood closed, we got a bunch of Norwood nurses. We got a bunch of travelers. A lot of people left because they couldn't deal with the heavy workload that's there mm -hmm. and how fast paced it is. I, um, I know the, the burden that, again, even before the pandemic that got put on when Morton closed the pediatric and the maternity, and then you mentioned Norwood, and then I heard they were shifting nurses from one hospital to another to fill slots, and we don't have enough at the local. Yeah, they were doing that. And um, this, this, you know, the overburden in the emergency room, and I know people are, you know, if they're waiting too long and they need mental health. They close Quincy too. Yeah, and they're signing themselves out of these things and they're going and they're not getting the, the proper care. And the bottom line is we got to take care of the residents that we represent as well as the workers who take care of these residents and, and the nurses are on the front line doing this. And, you know, during the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was, you know, all the attention was on nurses, whether it be in Massachusetts or New York that got really hit. But um, we're trying to take care of the local things here. and. Um, we've got to do a better job and get the word out. And um, again, um, anyone can contact my office at 617-722-1200 or email me at michael.brady at ma.gov. I'm in constant contact with the Mass Nurses Association. I talk to nurses constantly on the front line. I, I know them personally. They're living amongst our community. I have um, two cousins. One retired, Dr. New Hampshire, who is a nurse, and, and I have another uh, cousin who works at South Shore Hospital, and I have a niece who's a nurse practitioner and I kid with her she's smarter than all of my family because she's a nurse practitioner <laughs> doing very well but you know she's running around she takes care of um, patients that are raped as well and she's on call all the time besides doing her, her other job but um, I've seen you know firsthand what's going on and I'm, I'm appreciative of all the information you're giving to us but we got to get the word out and they need to bring the nurses mm -hmm. to the table to um, get this resolved it's been going on too long and uh, you know, I want to help out, and I, and I know our colleagues, I mean, Mark Pacheco is a senator locally in town. He's been a big supporter. Um, our chairman, Comerford, on the Senate side, she's been on these meetings with us and so forth. So we've got to get this addressed, and uh, it's been going on too long. And if we have to work on some other legislation, I know we passed some legislation with staffing levels, but if they're not abiding by those laws, then something else has to go further. Maybe we have to bring the mm -hmm. attorney general into this picture, too, because um, it's not right. And the bottom line is nurses are on the front line and then they're trying to help out the residents that we, we you know, our relatives. I mean, I, I remember I was a young lad, I got hit by a car and uh, I was in the hospital for three months and I had the best care. I was a lot younger than 30 old grace years in those days, but I was 10 years old and I, I got so well taken care of. And then my mother and father who were in these local hospitals and my brother who recently passed away last uh, May, he ended up getting COVID, he had a heart attack. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and it's a very serious issue for a lot of families out there. And mm -hmm. we got to take this seriously. We do, so, we do. Again, can you <coughs> read the website for the MNA sure. website? Um, the MNA website is www.massnurses.org. Okay. And, you know, we encourage people to go and take a look because, you know, it, information is out there related to every hospital pretty much that, you know, where we have our nurses and some of our legislative bills mm -hmm. that we're also looking to help address some of these things, mm -hmm. which is a bill on essential services so that we can preserve some of those services because you would think if you have a hospital that it should be from cradle to grave mm -hmm. and a lot of times it might be, but 
you're not going to actually be there for the cradle because they've taken away mm -hmm. maternity services? They've taken maternity and pediatrics from Morton. Right. They had to close Norwood because of the flood, which mm -hmm. was a huge hospital. Mm -hmm. They are moving NORCAP down to Morton and calling it MORCAP, and there'll be less beds. That's a whole psychiatric mm -hmm. population that's going to be affected. We, we've seen this. Thing. And they're yeah. all coming to yeah, us. Psychiatric services, and it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And sure. so something needs to happen in order to break that cycle. Uh -huh. Well, I know we're pressed for time. Uh, I encourage everybody to get involved. I'm going to be talking with my co co colleagues in the state house as well. Um, please keep in contact with us. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. there was legislation pending. We've got to get these pieces of bills passed and move forward. And um, if you can get involved, please contact my office, 617-722-1200. Or it's michael.brady at masenate.gov. I appreciate you both coming here today. This is very important information. We have to address it. Thank you for having thank us. You very much. And thank you to our viewers out there from the city of Brockton. Thank you.